This is Politics and Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning. Wajahat Ali is a columnist at the Daily Beast. His writing has appeared in The Atlantic, Washington Post, and The Guardian. And he's also the son of Pakistani immigrants. He has a new book out called Go Back to Where You Came From and other helpful recommendations on how to become American. We talked to him about Islamophobia in America, about the legacy of U.S. foreign policy from Bush to Obama to Trump and now to Biden, what he thinks motivates Muslim American voters, and his own experiences as a Pakistani American. As a reminder, like all of our episodes, this is an edited version of a much longer conversation with live audience questions. To hear more past episodes or find information about where to join us, please visit our website, pm101.live. Please also take a second to subscribe on whichever stream platform you're using right now so you don't miss our next episode on Monday featuring Mike Waltz, who's a congressman from Florida and former Green Beret. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. Uh, Mr. Wajahat Ali, how are you doing today? And uh, are you in D.C., New York? Where, Where are you calling in from? I'm currently in Alexandria, Virginia, where thankfully people still mask and still believe that COVID exists despite what we've been hearing uh, from others. So that's where I'm at right now. Okay. So I I used to live in Alexandria. I'm in Northeast DC now. I have to start going to the office three days a week and maybe we have different views. That's okay. Thankfully, we don't have to mask in the office come tomorrow because of the mayor of DC. So uh, maybe that is uh, something that we disagree with. I, you know what? If if you have, let me put it this way: if you get vaccinated, and you have proof of vaccines, and you have like a uh, uh, a small tight group, then I think that's fine. But the fact that the fact that like uh, the CDC just switched up, like even though two weeks ago they said we should mask, and all of a sudden they're like, all right, drop the mask, and they're like, all right, community guidelines. Uh, it just it reminds me of this year called 2021 where apparently we all threw away the masks and everything was awesome. And then something called Delta happened. So I hope that, you know, we uh, don't have a repeat repeat of that. I'm just a little bit worried because I got three kids under the age of five who still aren't vaccinated. And one of my kids is immunosuppressed. So I don't think it's that much suffering to once in a while wear a mask. But that's just me. And I'm obviously crazy. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm immuno. Uh, suppressed myself. I have uh, kidney issues that that that, are, that aren't you know they don't interfere with my everyday life. But I definitely don't want to get COVID. I'm just I, I think that a lot of Americans are kind of over it when the masking stuff. The question is the the utility of it when apparently COVID's airborne. They knew this from the beginning, and to really cut down on it, you need KN95 masks. So if the White House were to be wise and kind enough to pass all of those out, I'd have no problem wearing it. But I don't know if my Wajahat, if my surgical mask is going to protect anybody if I'm wearing it. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, see, so we agree with that, is that uh, we do need more access, right? Because the, according to the CDC, the community guidelines, they say, well, just ask your provider if you're in an area which is relatively safe and people are vaccinated. But what, what they don't tell you is, well, a lot of people don't have access to providers and a lot of rural Americans, the Americans that everyone loves the most, you know, some people in the Rust Belt, some people from, from low income uh, communities uh, also don't have access to, like you said, either masks, vaccines or healthcare providers. Right. And then you throw in not just children under five who aren't vaccinated, but also those who are immunosuppressed like yourself are elders and the reality that a third of Americans, Justin, aren't vaccinated. And so I just feel like it's one of those situations where if I can go biblical for a moment, because why not? If you ever read the Old Testament, uh, it's like Moses says, hey, here's some plagues coming. And people are like, silly Moses. And then the plagues come. And then he like delivers people from the Pharaoh. The Red Sea opens up. And then he's like, listen, just give me like 40 days. I'm going to go up to the mountain. Just give me 40 days. And I'll come down and like by the 40th day, he comes down and people are like just engaged in hedonism and worshiping a calf. And I just feel for Moses. Let me put it that way. Like that, that story hits deep. I I, like, can you imagine Moses coming down the mountain? Like what the F? I just said, wait 40 days. And people are like, I'm over it, Moses. I'm just over it. We had to worship a calf. But I hope you're right. I hope I'm wrong. For the sake of uh, for the sake of our security, I just love how we can both have a conversation about a quote unquote culture war, and do so c- civilly, right, without calling each other names. On that note, I'm going to kick it over to John Gunnison for the first few questions. Mr. Gunnison, over to you. 
So you wrote a book called Go Back to Where You Came From and Other Helpful Recommendations on How to Become American. It's brand new. It was just published a month ago. And your book, a lot of it deals with being a South Asian American and what it means to be a South Asian American today. Uh, we're living now in a year where we have a South Asian vice president, where we have South Asian and South Asian American figures who are much more prominent in American culture and media. So you've been writing in various magazines and newspapers for maybe 10 years or more now. Uh, do you think that over the time that you've been a public commentator in the broader American public, there's been an increased consciousness and knowledge about the South Asian American community? It's a good question. Uh, you know, I write about uh, I write about being an American who uh, is asked to love a country that doesn't always love them back. Uh, it's an elegy for the rest of us. Uh, I, I, that's why I you know, call the book Go Back to Where You Came From and other helpful recommendations on how to become American. And I am the son of two Pakistani Muslim immigrants. And I talk about in the book, you know, how it feels like to be the other in a country in which you're both a citizen and a suspect, when you're both us and them. And sometimes, you know, the, the response you get is, well, look, 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 man, Muslims are crushing it now. You got Miss Marvel and Hassan Minaj. And then people say, like you said, you got Kamala Harris as a South Asian and you got elected officials. Like what racism? We live in a post-racial society. Some people even think that Barack Obama is a Muslim. And look, you know, we got ta Coates and Oprah and the Beyonce. And so some people, you know, with utmost sincerity are like, isn't this the beauty and the realization of the American dream? True. You have these models of success, right? When I was growing up, the, you know, we didn't have any of that. We had Apu, which is a 2D character in The Simpsons played by, voiced by a white uh, character, a white actor, Hank Azaria, who modeled Apu based off of Peter Sellers, a white actor playing a brown man <laughs> in brown paint in the party. Follow that thread if you can. So there's a part of you living in 2022 that says, this is amazing, right? That America elected Barack Obama and it actually elected Kamala Harris. 81 million people came out for Biden and Harris. Amazing type of representation in media and movies. Amazing political representation. Stuff I didn't have growing up. But I'll give you the flip side, John, is in 2001, George W. Bush, if you guys remember, who I thought would, was going to be the worst president of my lifetime, but then America said, hold up, let me, let me show you some, something else in 2016. You know, he came out and he gave this speech about Islam and Muslim, where he said openly, you know, Islam is not the enemy. I feel terrible that Muslims feel like they're under threat. Islam means peace. If George W. Bush, the president who presided over the war on terror, was to run for president in 2024, Republicans would reject him as being a Muslim lover. So what we're dealing with now is a reality where there's a type of mainstreaming of anti-Muslim hate of people of color who come from quote unquote shithole countries that I born and raised in America never experienced while simultaneously uh, seeing the celebration of their representation. Like we're talking about open, just pure racism and hostility led by not just a fringe element, but you know, really the leader of the GOP. And this is something which is so dangerous that I as a brown man who was born and raised in California did not witness that fact that an entire political movement has now mainstreamed this hate that honestly I did not have growing up. That's the, that's a duality between the American dream and the American nightmare. I hope I was able to answer your question succinctly. Uh, yeah, Bajan, it's funny that you mentioned that George W. Bush might be looked at as a Muslim lover. He did indeed win the majority of the Muslim American vote in 2000, I think something 50, 60 percent of the vote, which of course, was more than enough to get him over the threshold that he needed in Florida to become president. Grover Norquist, you know, Grover Norquist, uh, you guys know him as like this conservative titan, you know, tax reformer, used to crow that the Muslim vote gave Bush the victory. Oh, the irony of irony. Specifically, like you said, in Florida, like 90% of registered Muslim voters in Florida went for Bush. Why did they vote for Bush? Because Bush courted Muslims. If you're Republican or Democrat, you can't take a base for granted. He courted Muslims. Grover Norquist did outreach. He said, listen, there are many people here who believe in God. They have traditional values, pro-business. He courted them. He, you know, he met them. He stepped inside a mosque. He talked about the ending of secret evidence. And the rest of us were like, for the love of God, Muslims, please do not vote for Bush. And like I remember in California, they're like, no, no, he'll be good for Muslims. I'm like, oh my God, what a disaster. And the irony of irony is, is that Bush wins Florida by like 538 votes. And Grover Norquist says without the Muslim vote, there'd be no Bush. And then Bush gets elected. And until Trump was the worst president for Muslims that spearheaded the war on terror. Oh, the irony of ironies, John. 
So what you're kind of demonstrating with that narrative is how malleable the electorate really is and how, uh, you know, the part of the electorate that you're describing could move uh, from 90 percent support to all the way in the other direction. Um, I've got a study from 2019 that shows that 72 percent of South Asian Americans were Democrats and planned to vote for the Democratic presidential nominee. Do you think that there's clear reasons why South Asian Americans are voting for Democrats, maybe even beyond some of the things you've already talked about with prejudice and the war on terror? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, going back to 2000, I think it's important, right? So uh, the majority of uh, Muslims voted for um, Bush, right? There were a lot, a lot of Asian Americans as well. Uh, and I'll include South Asians, like my parents' generation who came after post-1965, who voted Republican for a really long time. Family values, security, pro-business. Let's not forget, ladies and gentlemen, that Reagan and Bush were also pro-immigrant. I know it sounds crazy, like I'm talking out of Twilight Zone, but they were actually pro-immigrant. And their pro-immigrant policies it what is what makes, in part, Bush and that old generation of neocons hated by Stephen Miller, right? He calls them like the old antiquated Republicans who aren't part of the populist wave uh, of today. So there was something very attractive about the Republican Party, not just to Muslims, but also to many Asian Americans. However, you saw a shift after the war on terror. And specifically, you saw that shift in 2000. My parents switched in uh, 96, the second term of Clinton, because they did see that increasingly the Republican Party is shifting towards the family values, quote unquote, and the religious values and freedoms of one particular group at the expense of everyone else. That's white Christians. And so, so many then shifted to Obama and, and Democrats in 2008, specifically Muslims, right? You saw a complete shift where it was like 90% or so. Now, if you look at the data of 2020, about a third of Muslims went for Trump. You know that? And a lot of people are like, what the hell with the Muslim ban? What? Yes. The reason being, I would say, is, and it just also like kind of tracks with Asian Americans, because you'd assume it'd be higher, but it's about 70%, right? It's the, the family values, disinformation, the apathy about both sides. Uh, I would say an anti-black racism where many Asian Americans chased whiteness. We can unpack that and are still chasing whiteness at the expense of blackness. Um, also, the culture wars. Don't underestimate specifically the, the, the fear, even though it's not pronounced openly, of LGBTQ, LGBTQ, specifically T, transgender politics that worked in Virginia, unfortunately. And you, you come out and combine that together, and you see about a third that kind of go still for Republicans. And Republicans realize, all right, we've lost a majority of people of color. We're not going to really, you know, go go in on them, but we'll peel off some. We'll peel off some with, you know, talks about taxes. We peel off some with the both sides media coverage. We'll peel off some with culture wars about schools and LGBTQ, abortion. And all we need is a few. If we can peel off a few African-Americans, a few Latinos, a few Asian-Americans, get the white majority. Plus, you got, you know, the structural inequality with the Electoral College, the voter suppression, gerrymandering. That's all we need. And Steve Bannon said it, right? He goes, if we just get the white majority, double down, forget the audit that we did in 2012. And, you know, you, you remember the audit that they did. Hey, we need to court people of color. They're like, nah, we're going to go kind of all in on white Christian nationalism and court enough people of color around these issues, peel off enough, we'll win. In fact, I think Bannon said, we'll rule for the next 40 years. So you're increasingly seeing people of color who, and this is for Republicans, and these are from Republicans I talked to, like, damn it, man, we have some voters who would want to come to us who might be our natural allies if we just drop the blatant xenophobia and racism. But I think that is part and parcel now of the base and mainstream of the GOP, which is why probably you will never get those numbers again when it comes to POC. Uh, yeah, sure. And it's funny that you ask if I would be surprised that Muslim Americans moved towards Trump in 2020. And I, I may be one of the people that's the least surprised by that because I was living in the Middle East for the entirety of the Trump presidency and the 2016 election. And everyone that I knew was supporting Trump. I was the only one who was against Trump in my entire office. Uh, but um, I kind of want to ask you about your personal experience. Um, so your book is called Go Back to Where You Came From. And of course, where you came from is the San Francisco Bay Area. But, uh, you know, if someone is shouting that at you. They're probably thinking of where your parents and grandparents came from, which is, I think, Karachi and Sindh in the south of Pakistan. Did you get an opportunity to visit Karachi often growing up and as an adult? Was that also kind of part of your life experiences? Yeah, you know, so I, I was born and raised in the Bay Area to two Pakistani Muslim parents. And people always, 
you know, this is for immigrants and children of immigrants, but you don't have to be an immigrant to, to know the term fresh off the boat, where, you know, you come a, 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 as immigrants and you're supposed to assimilate or integrate whatever term you're supposed to use and you burn the boat. I always joke that my parents brought the boat inside the home. Like my parents didn't give an F about me integrating. Proof, they named me Wajahat. All right. They just they couldn't care less. Um, they didn't even teach me English uh, growing up in the Bay Area. Like I couldn't speak any English until I was dropped off at Child's Hideaway Preschool. And I mentioned this book. It's true. I only knew three phrases, John, of English when they dropped me off at Child's Hideaway Preschool. That was the name of the preschool. Child's Hideaway. Already foreboding and ominous. Uh, the three phrases of English I knew were shut up because my mother used to say shut up. Followed by idiot, because my mother used to say, shut up, idiot. And uh, oh, oh Pasquetio, if you're in my if you're my age, you grew up in the 80s and 90s, that was a Campbell's Scoop, Soup commercial, uh oh Spaghetti, but I used to say, uh oh Pasquetio. So like I was a very I joke, I was a very Desi kid, a very Muslim kid, and a very American kid, right? Um, in the sense that you know, I had turmeric stains on my shirt. I used to wear husky pants, couldn't speak English, was often the token brown guy and the token Muslim guy. Uh, as you can see, people, I was clearly a winner and I had to take ESL, English as a second language, even though I was born and raised in this country. But in my home, you know, we had a very loving, nurturing home where we were proud of our roots, our Pakistani roots and our Muslim roots and even our American roots. And so the funny thing is, is in America since 9-11, I get told, why do you hate us? And then when I go abroad and I've gone abroad to answer your question specifically to Pakistan many times growing up, I get asked, why do you guys hate us? And I'm like, it's interesting being both us and them. And, you know, during the war on terror, uh, when I used to go to Muslim-majority countries and I went back to Pakistan, I've gone back several times because I still have family in Karachi. They're like, why didn't you vote for Bush? I'm like, I didn't vote at all. And over here, they're like, why did you bring down the towers? I'm like, I'm born and raised in the Bay Area, California. That was 19 foreign hijackers. It's a very interesting existence to be seen as both a citizen and a suspect in your own country. And also, when you go to other Muslim-majority countries, they see me as an American. It's really fascinating. But, you know, growing up, I had immense pride, and I still do, with my Pakistani roots, and my parents made it a point to take me several times to Karachi, which is not only eye-opening, but also kind of, you know, it's, it, it is, you, you know that there's people there. You meet people. You see people. You know it's more nuanced, more complex. You don't fall into this, um, this narrative that's this week that's happening between the civilized refugees, see white refugees, versus everybody else, right? It gives you a kind of a depth of perspective and a cultural IQ that ends up being very helpful as we live in this globalized world. And it also gives you great recipes. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of what I was hinting at, what I am curious to hear about, this idea of being stuck in between two different cultures. You talk about kind of the burden of representation as a South Asian and a Muslim in America. When you're visiting Karachi, do you feel also that kind of burden of representation as an American? Like, Do you think that you have to talk about America in a certain way because you're trying to kind of communicate a message about who Americans are. Do you feel that kind of reverse burden of representation? Yeah, it's wild, right? Because unlike you, you know, we're Americans and we go there and oftentimes then we become the token ambassadors of America. And it's so interesting to see what people latch onto. So they're like, why do you guys hate black people so much? Why are you guys obsessed with guns? Why'd you vote for Bush? Why are you guys bombing Muslim countries, right? They, they seem to like, if, if I could like boil down and I've been very lucky to travel around the world, the obsession that people have or like the curiosity, I would say, is I don't understand. You guys pay taxes. How come you guys don't have free health care? That's one. Like they don't get it. They're not trying to be snarky. They just don't get it. Number two, our obsession with guns is another one. Number three, both Bush and Trump, just the existence of Trump. I happened to be in some Muslim majority countries, uh, you know, giving workshops uh, during the 2016 election. And they were like, you know, people think they're uncivilized. Nope. They know a lot more about us and our politics and our culture than we know about them. They were just amazed by Trump. Right. And in Pakistan in particular, you know, you guys might think, oh, Pakistan, Muslims, they hate us. I have family in Pakistan and I can tell you that people and this is the first time, John, this is like painful. They feel pity towards America. And let me repeat this. They feel pity. They're like, wow, Trump was terrible. And they're praying. They prayed for America. Like I'm like, yo, Pakistan's not doing that well. They're like, I know, I know, I know, but we're used to it. But like, oof, America. And so there is something painful for many global citizens seeing America, this country, despite, you know, the, the pain and the hypocrisy over a foreign policy, the, the imperialism, backing terrible dictators. Still, it's, it's this beacon of hope. You see it happening right now, right, with the leadership of Biden and what's happening in Ukraine. People still look to America as the most powerful nation, the leader of democracy, despite our hypocrisy and our failures in the past, right, to rally the troops, to stand for something, at least, at least to 
be at least say the right words. There's a reason why so many people come here. It's not because they hate this country. They did this uh, Gallup at this poll in 2009 of a billion Muslims. And they said, do you hate America? They said, no, we actually love America for its freedoms, for its values, for democracy, for technology, for opportunities. The two things that they hated, John, was they hated the hypocrisy between our values and our foreign policy, especially in Muslim countries, and also the disrespect towards Muslims and Islam, especially in the policies and the media. Now, when I go to Pakistan, it's so funny. I become the ambassador of America and I'm kind of like, yo, 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 not everyone voted for Trump. Not everyone was for the war on terror. Not everyone is like reckless with guns. Like it's very funny that I have to go then be an ambassador for a country whose president, the last president, wanted a Muslim ban and still trying to like, not necessarily put a good face on the country, but saying this is a more layered, nuanced explanation of a country of 330 million people. So Waj, I do, I do want to get into that wing of the party. You said your parents switched in 96. I switched in 2016. That's when I voted for Hillary Clinton because of a lot of what you're talking about now. But before then, I worked with, for example, Paul Gozar. Uh, I didn't work for him, but my boss was in that wing of the party. And I think the guy may have gone crazy, like liter. And I say that not to joke. I think he may have lost like his literally, mind. Literally crazy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. L- legitimately, because he's very different the way he sounds, the way he uh, interacts with people from when I ate lunch with him in 2014 to now. But um, you recently wrote about the wing of the GOP party that uh, is kind of rooting Putin on or sharing his values. Obviously, Paul Gozar is one. I was wondering if you could briefly outline who a couple of the other ones are and then um, why. Yeah, so I wrote about this, and this is a, a trend that I'm not the only one who's written about it, but I think it has to be put into focus because I think it's very dangerous, right? So just today, tonight, in fact, Pat Robertson came out from the crypt and, you know, did this pro-Putin uh, kind of message from the 700 Club, and he, you know, tied it to his type of uh, eschatological, you know, end of times narrative about, like, you know, how it's important for Putin to do this, uh, you know, and for the kingdom of God. And that's very important, this type of white Christian nationalism. I want to be very clear. I'm not attacking white people. I'm not attacking Christians or white Christians. It's a strain of white Christian nationalism, which has been part and parcel of America, which is fuels this political movement where Jesus kind of becomes a mascot uh, for the sake of identity politics. And this type of white Christian nationalism, according to this really remarkable report that came out on February 9th of more than 60 scholars in America, said that white Christian nationalism was a major fuel for the violent insurrection that happened on January 6th. And also those symbols and that language and those conspiracy theories were prevalent and it's important of future violence, right? And specifically, the reason why they like Putin and the reason why Putin has had this mutually reciprocal relationship with the GOP is that they see Putin, and I'm quoting, as the lion of Christianity, the lion. Him and Orban are defending, quote, Western civilization. Western civilization is defined as white Christian Europeans under assault, under assault from who? LGBTQ plus rights, immigrants of color, Muslims, feminism, and secularism. And so they're willing to back Putin and Russia uh, and Orban and, and others whom they see as defenders of uh, a Western civilization, and they want to mimic that type of leadership in America. Democracy in America is second, and then this type of nationalism is first. Trump publicly asked, why do I have to get tough on Putin? And he tweeted that Russia leaked the DNC's stolen emails because, quote, Putin likes me. Manafort also attended that now infamous Trump Tower meeting with a Russian lawyer who was allegedly offering dirt on Hillary Clinton to the Trump campaign. But Paul Manafort's ultimate gift to Putin came at the Republican National Convention in 2016, when the Trump campaign worked to alter the official party platform to be softer on Russia. According to a report by the Daily Beast, in meetings drafting the platform, a delegate supporting Ted Cruz proposed language that called for providing lethal defensive weapons to Ukraine. The Trump campaign then reportedly tabled that amendment so that they could work on the language. Quote, when the language came back up after consultation with Trump staff, the section called merely for appropriate assistance to Ukraine. And a lot of what you just cited is why I did leave the party. But I think right now with Ukraine, it provides an opportunity not only to unite 
the Republican Party and the Democratic Party to unite a lot of Americans together. But I think we're actually seeing that. Tucker Carlson's now doing a 180 and saying Americans are right to hate Vladimir Putin. In addition to that, you have Fox News uh, bringing on Jennifer Griffin, who you know, but for everybody else, she's one of the most respected reporters anywhere. She covers the DOD and Pentagon for Fox News. She's literally fact-checking the Looney Tune nutbag pro-Putin former Trump advisors that go on shows with Trey Gowdy and other opinion hosts and telling the Fox viewers, no, this is wrong, which I don't think I've ever seen before. So do we think that the general bipartisan support, the goodwill for Ukraine, Ukrainians, democracy versus Putin provides the GOP leaders an opportunity here to begin to ostracize that extreme prejudiced, hateful wing of the party and maybe turn the corner into something more positive? I don't think so. I have seen what you said where, you know, there's been a shift. The shift is because literally the world and the public is against it. And you're also seeing some of the more cynical old hands in the Republican Party, like McConnell and others who realize what a danger Putin is, uh, kind of flex their muscle. But I do think they're the dinosaurs. I think they're on the way out. And so I think when you see the transformation of Elise Stefanik, when you see the transformation of even DeSantis, when you see the right wing trend of Abbott, it's kind of like a very funny horror movie where you're seeing Abbott and DeSantis try to like compete with the most horrific policy going further and further to the right. Because as we know, and as you guys know, as old hands, they're still gunning for the 2024 nomination in case like Trump croaks. So it's a DeSantis Abbott, DeSantis Abbott, anything vile and horrible that happens, you know, anti-gay policy, Abbott goes, wait, 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 I have something more. And then DeSantis goes, no, wait, wait, I have to stop the woke act. And then he goes, no, no, wait, 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 I'll do another uh, act. And then DeSantis goes, I'm just going to say, don't say gay. So that's where you're at. So I understand your hope for that. And I'll say also this because I'm in D.C. and Virginia and I used to go on CNN and in the green room. A lot of these folks, guys, who come on TV and do the pro-Trump and pro-MAGA talking points, behind the scenes, Justin can attest to this, they they hate MAGA. They, think, they look down at MAGA. They think it's, it's toxic. But they also know how their bread is buttered. And so the people of courage stay silent. And the people who should be like Liz Cheney, I can't believe I'm saying this, but this is where we're at, where Liz Cheney, to her credit, did two good, amazing things. Risk her political career because she said, I'm putting America before a violent insurrection. Look at the response, Justin. That's why, that's why I think they're lost. Look at the response. And I'm going to remind people this. Two weeks ago, the RNC, not Marjorie Taylor Greene, not Paul Gosar, RNC, the Republican National Committee, on its own, unprovoked, decided to say, that the violent insurrection of January 6th that killed five people was a legitimate political protest done by ordinary citizens. And they censured who? Not Marjorie Taylor Greene, Liz Cheney, and Adam Kinzinger. So for that reason, Justin, I think it's a party that's gone. But I hope for our democracy, you're right. So, Wajahad, I can agree with you specifically having worked for the GOP, people on the Hill hated Trump. Uh, Not only that, like you said, and I'm talking senators, I'm not going to name names here, they just looked down on Trump. They, they not only looked down on Trump, they looked down on his voters. There was a large outrage about Hillary Clinton calling them deplorables. That's what these senators and members of the House were calling them uh, behind closed doors. It was, it's, it's a crazy thing. But I did want to follow up on one thing you said. You said, look at Liz Cheney. She stood up for democracy. She made a big scene of this, and rightfully so. And her political career is probably going to be over. I'm going to go a step further. It's it's very, very likely over. Um, so what what do you think would happen if Kevin McCarthy tomorrow were to come out and say, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gozar, you not only yucked it up with white nationalists, you worked together to put out an America first platform that was filled with white nationalist stuff that ultimately had to be scuttled due to media attention. We don't want you in the Republican Party anymore. What would happen to Kevin McCarthy if he just attacked those two extreme racists? I don't think he's going to be the House leader in 2022 uh, when the Republicans most likely take uh, back the House at the very least. Uh, He would be committing a, a type of kamikaze. Uh, like Liz Cheney, but he'd be kamikaze against the extreme toxic wing of the GOP, which 
like you said, you know, and I have some stories of senators who said like this guy is terrible, right? But they kept quiet. I'll give you an example. Uh, hell, I'll say it. L- Lindsey Graham, ladies and gentlemen, uh, right after the 2016 election, I got invited to some event, right? Some DC event. I'm there at the event. Some people go and thank Lindsey Graham. There were a lot of Republicans in this room, and a lot of people, a lot of Republicans, Justin, were like, you know, they were worried. This was after Trump won, guys. Okay, so there were Republicans worried about this country, and they're like, what's going to happen? So I caught this exchange because i was right there and lindsey graham was right in front of me so there's this couple that said you know what's what's gonna happen this is what lindsey graham said well he, they're gonna fuck up soon enough and we'll be there to clean up their shit and uh in the lindsey graham voice which i don't have right now but usually i do it pretty good if i hear him <laughs> that so, wasn't that bad <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, usually like, yeah 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 usually he was, yeah, he was like softer i forgot the the southern twine. i made a little texan but you know lindsey graham did not do that justin right and so you saw the transformation of the GOP and you're seeing the transformation of the GOP in the last five years where the people that you and I know, but I'm talking about senators, elected officials, I'm talking about freaking chiefs of staff, advisors, they know how toxic this is, but they realize they will lose their elections. They will lose how they their bread is buttered. As someone said, I'll be exiled and I can't afford to be exiled. Or they say, look what happened to Liz Cheney. Look what happened to X, Y, and Z. I can't afford that. You also have to realize people were social animals, right? So it's not just your political career uh, or your financial career, right? You know, a lot of these folks go to church with these other folks. A lot of these people date these folks. A lot of these people go to like the same country clubs, right? It's like, you, you, so you, you're willing to lose all that. And instead, they just kind of tolerate it. And so McCarthy, you'll see a mild, a very mild slap on the wrist, then he'll get hit from the right wing, but he can't afford to do it anymore because I believe they have been empowered over the past five years. That being said, he should do it. He should take the hit. And I think if he does do it, in a way, it will help Republicans if they vomit out this uh, extremist element that, that I think is the base. Um, it will help them. It will help their, their national strategy in 2024. So, Waj, we're talking about how some members of the GOP are praising Putin. Uh, they clearly have no ability to talk about these topics in an intelligent way. But in the last couple of months, we also saw some kind of questionable comments and proposals from the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, in January, which was already after three months of briefing from the IC, from the Biden administration, uh, with the conclusion that Russia was likely to invade Uh, We saw a proposal that said that no broad-based sanctions should be used against Russia from Jayapal and Barbara Lee. Uh, We saw Rashida Tlaib saying that the U.S. were rushing to war against uh, against Russia and that the United States should not um, provide lethal aid to assist the Ukrainians. So I I don't want to make any kind of equivalency at all between the kind of the blatantly pro-Putin comments and these kinds of suggestions. But the question is just, you know, these ideas seem to be very far away from the consensus for how the U.S. should be responding to Russia's war of aggression. And do we think that the progressive wing of the Democratic Party is totally out of touch here? Do we think that they are able to kind of propose a compelling foreign policy vision? Because if they do want to lead the country, they're going to need to know how to do that, right? Yeah, so I, I think I'm glad you didn't do the both sides false equivalents here. But and I do, I think what there is some there is an overlap uh, of an anti-war type of uh, you know uh, isolationism that is very popular uh, post the the bloody and exhausting war on terror that is shared not just by many progressives but also I think many on the right right so like you saw that with Trump also where they're like uh, we shouldn't focus so much in foreign countries and he at least said it even though he did and his base was like yeah yeah focus on America first right and the, what the progressives though it's kind of this understanding of history and American imperialism and you know the hypocrisy but at the same time you're seeing kind of a within the progressive wing I think you're seeing a, a shift here where some people uh, and, and this is like I don't even call I don't even call them ultra left. They've gone so left that they join the hard right in the sense that in their disgust of, of American imperialism, they sometimes get blinded to the imperialism of Russia and China, right? And you and when you see folks like that, you're like you have to be intellectually consistent. If you're against imperialism and and authoritarian regimes and unnecessary wars, then you can't just like rush to be pro China or pro Russia and appear on RT. You see that some on the ultra left do that and they buy into the pro-Putin uh, stuff, hook, line, and sinker. And I am not one of those folks, and I think most are, are not. When it comes to NATO, you're also seeing 
And it's an interesting little conversation that's happening on the progressives that don't add more NATO countries, you know, uh, it only like intensifies the need for war and what has war done. But you're seeing now, I think, with Biden's leadership, and this is why it's important and why elections matter, Biden, and he jokes that he's been in the Senate for like 100 years, because of Biden, because of the United States, he's kind of reclaimed the mantle of U.S. as at least the de facto spokesman for democracy and used his uh, his relationships with the EU and NATO and actually strengthened these alliances, which I believe are important in the 21st century, in the post-World War II climate, as we're witnessing the rise of white supremacist movements and far-right movements that want to dismantle specifically the post-World War II order, which has not been perfect, ladies and gentlemen, which I know has failed many times. But if you're giving me a choice, John, between Russia and China and a U.S.-led multicultural coalition where, at the very least, we are for democracy and human rights, my friend, I say you go with the United States and this multicultural coalition, right? Imperfect as it might be, and you try to strengthen it, and you're seeing the value of this relationship, of these values right now as the world in a remarkable fashion. I think we're all kind of surprised. You know, Every two hours, we're look, looking at new news uh, updates where uh, more and more folks are flexing their muscle. Like, you even got the Swiss. Who even got the Swiss uh, to not be neutral? Right. And so uh, it's one of those situations where uh, I feel that I disagree with that sentiment of the progressive wing. Uh, I understand where they're coming from. But, yeah, that is not the popular sentiment, at least on foreign policy, where we are right now. So we're going to go to the audience questions. I'll be very focused. So uh, great discussion so far. I won't jump into some of the social cultural dynamics I could bring up. One thing I haven't think has been mentioned yet, and I'd be curious about your perspective on it. I think the white race in the U.S. suffers from a tremendous aspect of just entitlement. And and speaking as a 10th generation white guy growing up, um, uh, the way I've seen it evolved over the last 25 years in particular, I think exacerbates the way you have very well expressed the problems associated with that damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of model. And, and I think there was great analysis on some of the socioeconomic problems associated statistically with a lot of the people involved in the January 6th riots and problems that they had. But, but entitlement seems to be a major vein. What's your thoughts on entitlement and how that factors in and, and what can be done about it? Jim, I should Venmo you. Uh, you said my point for me. Look, when 2016, many reporters of color and I covered the election, many journalists of color, and it's not because we, you know, have like uh, superior brains or we have like access to like like different books. It's because we have lived in America where we have experienced both the American dream and the American nightmare, where we've been seen both as a suspect and a citizen. It gives you a perspective, right? It widens your perspective and lens about what this thing called America is, who's seen as a protagonist, who's seen as the villain, who's the sidekick, who's excised. So we said, we repeatedly told our colleagues, it is not economic anxiety, which is the primary motivator for Trump's space. It is cultural anxiety, this fear that they're losing power. And we were dismissed. I mean, how often did many of us hear economic anxiety, economic anxiety, economic anxiety? And then every single sober study that has been done in the past five years marking why, not the only reason, ladies and gentlemen, the primary motivator for Trump's voters and the primary vo reason why so many switch from Obama to Trump is because they believe this country no longer belongs to them. They believe they're being replaced. They believe that they are no longer in their, in their dad's and, and grandfather's vision of America, right? Specifically, if you've been in power your whole life, what does equality look like? Equality looks like oppression. I'll give you an example. If you're in a boardroom and those 10 chairs, those 10 board chairs have been populated by white men for 200 years. Now you fast forward and let's just say 30 years ago, there was one white woman. Then 10 years after that, there was one black man. Then you fast forward to 2022. Now you got one white woman, one black man, and one Asian American, and one Latino, but you still got six white men. For the four people of color and the one white woman, it's like, oh my God, we got invited to the party. Finally, some parody. Hooray. We finally, you know, get, get to like eat this thing called uh, meatloaf and, you know, cottage cheese. This is wonderful. From the perspective of the six white men, they're like, oh my God, they're replacing us. And that fear is what Trump played into. And in fact, what's so dangerous, just last month in his rally, he's gone all in and saying that white people are the real victims in America. And he said, with a lie, that white people now in this country have to go back to the bus uh, to get the vaccines, which is a total bullshit. 
right? But what he's saying is that you white men are now the aggrieved victim. You white men, especially you white women, you can no longer be yourself. You white men are being, wait for it, replaced. And so for the rest of us, we're like, wait a second. Uh, have you seen how black people are treated in this country? Have you seen the history of America? What are you talking about? Yet the people taking up the guns, Jim, and like you said in the violent, uh, January 6th violent insurrection, they weren't, it wasn't poor people, middle class, upper middle class folks. And when it says economic anxiety, the people who made under $50,000 didn't go for Trump. They went for Hillary Clinton. It is predominantly this type of cultural anxiety and racial anxiety, this fear of being replaced, this fear of equality that is causing this, like uh, Van Jones said, a white lash, a white rage, a type of nervous breakdown. In fact, I'll take it a step further, and I have written about this, and I say we're witnessing here, both in America and in Europe, the death rattle of white supremacy. I'm not talking about white people, folks. I'm talking about white supremacy. The death rattle of white supremacy has transformed into a death march, which explains the appeal of Nick Fuentes, which explains explains the rise of violent hate groups, which explains why the number one domestic terror threat is white supremacist terrorism, which explains Putin and Orban and why so many Americans, people like Tucker Carlson, are openly parroting white nationalist talking points. This is something where white folks have to do a lot of work. And the data shows that when white folks talk about this to other white folks, it has the greatest impact. So thank you, Jim, for bringing that up. Happy to. And uh, I'll be happy to give you my Venmo. One last time. Uh, so we have Nas for the last question. The book is still shiny and chrome, ladies and gentlemen. It's still shiny and chrome. Does if it you can have buy that it. new book smell? It has a new book smell. It's tasty. It's delicious. You can hang it from your car. It came out like four weeks ago. It came out a month ago. But uh, it's been, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those books that I got love from Katie Couric, all the way from Katie Couric to Ishmael Reed to NPR to Reza Aslan. So it's, it's nice that you can, you know, when you can, when you, when a lot of different folks can find, uh, something worthwhile there it's good it it, it was um i was ast astounded uh lo looking at all the positive reviews um so we will just go to one last question nosh real quick and then we'll let mr watch go nosh over to you all right thank you i'm a presbyterian republican in the silicon valley i've never experienced any discrimination from the republican or the conservative or the white man although i'm moderate republican but yet try to be a conservative Christian in the Silicon Valley. So why do you not focus on the left and their stereotype against the others? Thank you. So I'm very happy that you have not experienced it. I mean that sincerely. Unfortunately, that is not the lived reality of so many other black and brown folks in America, uh, both the subtle microaggressions and also the overt aggressions oftentimes now by our last president, the president of the United States of America, uh, and the policies that were put in place. Uh, I understand uh, the feeling of being uh, the other. Uh, trust me, I get it. Uh, and I'm from the Bay Area originally, and I know that often, not all people are uh, many, they're pretty progressive folks, and it might be a little hard there to be a conservative. But there's a difference between being the minority voice uh, and policies that are put in place to effectively neutralize you and oppress you. So I'll give you an example. Um, you, you cannot be a fan of the liberals and progressives. That's fine. But you do not see President Biden saying something like, let's promote CRT bans, which then becomes a Trojan horse to don't say gay, which then empowers parents to go after teachers if they talk about, you know, Black History Month or if they talk about Mouse, which is a graphic novel about the Holocaust. You don't see people mainstreaming the white nationalist replacement theory, right? You don't see the liberal senators and others saying, go, go back to where you came from. And you don't tell, you don't see them telling, you know, uh, Tim Scott, go back to where you came from, or like any other person of color who's a Republican colleague, go back to your, where you came from and fix that country before you came here. That's how Donald Trump treated the squad, regardless of what you think about the squad. Or you hear them saying, oh, you guys come from shithole countries. You know, these types of policies and this type of egregious open rhetoric, which is tied to, and I'm going to say this again, I'm not saying this lightly. I'm not saying this flippantly. This is literally white nationalist talking points, which is now mainstream. White nationalist talking points. People in the KKK, people who are part of militia groups, people who are part of the Nazis, uh, people who are white supremacists. This is the talking points now openly parroted in right-wing movements and mainstreamed. And that's why I don't think there's a quote-unquote both sides. There can be the intolerance. I get it. There can be the, the, the type of uh, arrogance. The, the type of snobbery, the type of mutual cancellation on both sides. I get that.
but we are dealing with a movement in my in my opinion where even if you're a conservative and a christian uh and a republican it's still not good enough if you don't give your allegiance completely and your fealty completely to the modern republican party and i'll give you two examples liz cheney adam kinzinger liz cheney went with trump 93 percent of the time kinzinger went 95 percent of the time and it still wasn't enough and that's your warning right there that is all we have for you today. Again, huge thanks to Wajaha Ali, to our audience for their questions, and to you for being here. As a reminder, like all of our episodes, this is an edited version of a much longer conversation with live audience questions. To hear more past episodes or find information about where to join us live, please visit our website, pm101.live. Please also take a second to subscribe on whichever podcast streaming service you're using right now so you don't miss our next episode on Monday featuring Mike Waltz, who's a congressman from Florida and a former Green Beret. This has been Politics and Media 101, produced in partnership with Clubhouse. I'm Jeff Browning on behalf of Justin Higgins, our co-founder and our team. Thank you very much for being here. We hope to see you and hear from you soon.